Hello and welcome to video lecture number 16, Imperial Reform. We have three different sections we're going to look at today. The first is the legacy of war. Uh, the second is uh, an, an examination of George Grenville and some of his policies as Prime Minister. Uh, and third, we're going to look at an open challenge which was posed by the colonists to the Stamp Act. So, in 1763, all British subjects, including the American colonists, celebrated their victory over the French in the Great War for Empire. Uh, but the celebrations were short-lived. Uh, the British national debt had increased by more than 75%, uh, and while demanding more in taxes from subjects at home, imperial officials also expected the colonists to bear the cost of administering the newly enlarged empire in North America. That these same colonists had a history of evading trade laws and resisting parliamentary control uh, convinced the crown of the need to reform the imperial system uh, to ensure stricter enforcement of any prospective revenue measure. Uh, thus, although the Sugar Act of 1764 cut by one half the tax imposed by the Molasses Act in 1733, uh, it strengthened the means of collecting these taxes colonial merchants would not be able to avoid this new tax as easily as they had its counterpart. Uh, and accused violators could be tried in something called vice admiralty courts, uh, that is, in, in maritime courts without the benefit of juries, and likely outside of where the jurisdiction, uh, of the jurisdiction where the alleged uh, violations had occurred. James Otis Jr. wrote the most influential colonial response to the Sugar Act, um, even as the debate over the propriety of the 1764 Act was commencing, however, Parliament was already contemplating a more far-reaching Stamp Act uh, because the colonists insisted that they could be taxed only with their consent, uh, given directly or through their representatives. Uh, Thomas Waitley attempted to convince them that they were represented in Parliament in the same way that, quote, nine-tenths of the people of Britain were, virtually. The Stamp Act Congress rejected Waitley's arguments. Um, <clears throat> rather abruptly, after 1765, the issue of whether the colonists were re represented in Parliament uh, disappeared completely from the public discourse. So let's take a closer look at this section. This is imperial, re imperial reform. We're dealing with the years 1763 through 65. Our first subsection is the legacy of war. The Great War for Empire fundamentally changed the relationship between Britain and its American colonies. The war exposed the weak authority of British royal governors and officials. To assert their authority, then, the British began a strict enforcement of the Navigation Acts. Parliament passed what was called the Revenue Act, then, in 1762, that curbed corruption in the Customs Service and the Royal Navy was then authorized to seize vessels that were carrying goods between the mainland colonies and between the French islands. So now the Navy is getting involved. The British victory over the French resulted in a shift also in imperial uh, military policy. In 1763, the Ministry deployed a peacetime army in North America, uh, indicating its willingness to use force in order to, pres in order to preserve its authority over the colonies. As Britain's national debt soared, uh, higher import duties were imposed at home on tobacco and sugar. Uh, and excise levies, which are a kind of sales tax, uh, were in, they were increased. Uh, these increases were then passed on to British consumers. American colonists paid only about one-fifth uh, of the annual imperial taxes that British taxpayers had to pay. Uh, to collect these taxes then, the government doubled the size of the British bureaucracy and increased its powers. They were, they were getting very serious about collecting these taxes. Uh, smugglers were arrested and cargo was seized everywhere. Uh, the price of empire had turned out to be debt and a more intrusive government. Uh, to reverse the growth of this government power, uh, British opposition parties like the, the Country Party and the Radical Whigs demanded that Parliament be made more representative of the property-owning classes. Radicals like John Wilkes called for an end to rotten boroughs, which were tiny electoral districts whose voters were controlled by wealthy aristocrats and merchants. 
So let's go to the next section then. Let's look at George Grenville, Prime Minister, and his imperial reforms. In 1763, uh, the British Empire in America had expanded, but the, but the war left Britain in debt. Uh, British taxpayers paid, again, five times as much as the Americans did, uh, and that motivated the British leaders to increase the taxation on the Americans. Uh, Prime Minister George Grenville won approval of the Currency Act in 1764 that banned the use of paper money as legal tender, thereby protecting British merchants from colonial currency that was not worth its face value. Grenville then proposed uh, the Sugar Act of 1764, which was a new navigation act, um, and it replaced the widely evaded Molasses Act of 1733. Americans argued that the Sugar Act would not only wipe out trade with the French islands, but it was also contrary to their constitution, since it established a tax, and, quote, all taxes ought to originate with the people. The Sugar Act closed a Navigation Act loophole by extending the jurisdiction of vice admiralty courts to all customs offenses, uh, many of which had previously been tried uh, before local common law courts. After living under a policy of salutary neglect, Americans felt that the new British policies were discriminatory uh, and challenged the existing constitutional practices and understandings. Um, British officials insisted on the supremacy of parliamentary laws uh, and denied that colonists were entitled to even the, the most traditional rights of standard everyday Englishmen, uh, claiming that the right of no taxation without representation was confined to inhabitants of Great Britain only. Uh, the Americans, as colonists, were seen as second-class subjects of the king. So let's look at the Stamp Act then. This was the open challenge made by the colonists. Taxation sparked the first great imperial crisis. Uh, Grenville followed the Sugar Act with a proposal for the Stamp Act in 1765. Uh, the Stamp Act would require small printed markings on all court documents, land titles, and various other documents, uh, and served as a means to increase revenue uh, in order to keep British troops in America. Grenville vowed to impose a Stamp Act in 1765 unless the colonists would figure out a way to tax themselves to pay for their own defense. Benjamin Franklin proposed American representation in Parliament, but British officials rejected the idea, uh, arguing that Americans received virtual representation in Parliament, and that was through um, the merchants and how they were represented. Grenville then introduced the Stamp Act in Parliament, with the goals being not to only raise revenue, but also to assert the right of Parliament to lay an internal tax on the colonies. Parliament also passed, at the request of General Gage, the Quartering Act, which directed colonial governments to provide barracks and food for British troops stationed in the colonies. Uh, Parliament also approved Grenville's proposal that violations of the Stamp Act be tried in vice admiralty courts. Using the doctrine of this parliamentary supremacy, uh, Grenville's attempt to fashion an imperial system in America ended up provoking a constitutional confrontation with the colonies on things like taxation, jury trials, quartering of the military, and this question of representative self-government. Okay, this does conclude video lecture number 16. At this time, please answer the review questions in your notes.